1500s to uh, 1900s. It could be 1500 to 1800. It could uh, it'll also it can also be 1600 to 1800, either or. So we are approximately in that timeline. Now remember th that we're at the time period when the Third Great Awakening revival is spreading out. And America is flourishing. It's in its age of prosperity. And the gospel is being preached like there's no tomorrow. So the Second Great Awakening is spreading very effectively. But at the same time, we must remember that the devil's people, the devil's men, are also working behind the scenes, trying to destroy the, uh, not just the church, but even the world itself. And I've taught you that. A lot of interesting things what was going on behind the scenes. So never forget our enemy. It's so important to remember that. Never forget our enemy. If you forget the enemy, then you're going to forget your purpose of work as a church. Throughout the beginning to the end of history, ever since the B.C.s to the 80s, there's one unbroken chain like I taught you. Good versus evil all the time. All the time. There's always bad guys and good guys. Story wouldn't be exciting if there is no bad guy and good guy, right? You ever wonder why that happened? So all of this comes down for a reason. There's always a bad guy behind the scenes. During this time, we're going to see the two greatest devils that messed up the entire, our entire history and it affected the entire world. If these two devils never existed, then these two events probably wouldn't have happened. But these two devils destroyed our entire world where our own brainwash system today and its ideologies today came from these two men. So I will cover these two devils. But it's a combination of three, three combinations where our world fell apart and where we came to today. So I've covered the first part, which is don't forget your enemy, the Rome. Rome was there from beginning to end of church history. Always Rome. Rome was always the enemy. A lot of the elites behind the scenes and closed doors all came from Rome. Remember that. Babylon. Mystery Babylon. That's why it's called mystery for a reason. It's secret. It's private. It's closed door. So that enemy was working and they attacked the Bible, the Word of God. Because remember, all the fruit came from the Bible, the Word of God. That's where everything came from. So they attacked the Word of God. The other two was able to uh, take advantage of biblical criticism, uh, criticizing the Word of God, and then put a hundred steps further to what we are today, the wrong ideologies that we have today. So let's cover this passage. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And God gives a warning right here in verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. So Paul warned Timothy that we are to keep the fight. We are to fight the good fight, keep preaching the word of God no matter what. Why? Because there's an enemy coming out. The enemy is vain babblings and science falsely so-called. And it is during this time period that false science has appeared and vain babblings has spread everywhere. And that was truly the fight at verse 12 of 1 Timothy 6.12 that the Philadelphians, uh, that this Philadelphia church age had to battle against. So we will continue on the Philadelphian church period at the exact timeline of the Third Great Awakening Revival. Amen. So remember that uh, at the same time as every Great Awakening Revival, I mentioned that there are seven, all right, Dr. Upman believes that there are seven that came out. Within these seven, there's always evil working behind the scenes. So remember that. There's always evil working behind the scenes in each Great Awakening revival. Remember that the cults came out, right? So there were many cults that were born that came out. Uh, that's the timeline where Mormonism, where Seventh-day Adventism, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, the Unitarian Church, Christian Science, 
You ever wonder why they all popped out at the timeline of the third and fourth Great Awakening revivals? Why'd they come out? Where were they during the 1300, 1200s? Why'd they come out? So there's no doubt that there is an enemy behind the scenes, a devil behind the scenes, who's trying to corrupt and to destroy the Great Awakening revivals. By planting more churches, it can confuse the body of Christ. And they can't find the true church of God. So then the Lord countered again with the third Great Awakening revivals. And the Jesuits, they were spreading out biblical criticism, textual criticism, through the French schools at the French Enlightenment. Then they infected the German schools with German rationalism. It's about to head toward, you can guess, England next. The devil always aims at universities, higher ed. That's how all of history changed, is through the universities. Hitler once said, you give me the schools and I can control the next generations. It's always the schools that pollute everything. So then, in spite of the attacks from the enemy with the Jesuits and the cults, through the higher ed system from the Jesuits themselves, the Lord uh, still moved a mighty, uh, moved a mighty work with the Third Great Awakening Revival. We will now uh, mention some names and some big men during the, uh, during the Third Great Awakening Revival. I mentioned about uh, Sheldon Jackson. He's a, he was a Princeton graduate. Then the next one I mentioned was A.B. Earl. All right, A.B. Earl. All right, so I'm just going to put abbreviation right here. These were men who were circuit riding preachers. In other words, they would travel, uh, they would travel around the states, city to city, town to town, town to town, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ and planting churches. I mentioned some other big names that came out this time where people get the Matthew Henry commentary and uh, other people. So they came out during this third great awakening timeline. I also mentioned many other missionaries that were sent out yes. that time. The Lord is just spreading like Amen. wildfire everywhere. Amen. Now German rationalism, when it was on the rise, the Lord raised up a, somebody to attack German rationalism. Page 97 of Dr., uh, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman's book titled The History of the New Testament Church, Volume 2. Klaus Harms, Klaus Harms in Germany, all right, attacked German rationalism Amen. in Germany, which at this time was in its most viral state. Neve says that a revival of religion came to Germany in the first half of the 19th century. It came through because of him, Klaus Harms. So the Lord was able to counter something, give them one remaining last revival or light in spite of a growing apostasy and the roots of Calvinism and higher education that the Jesuits and their biblical criticism was able to take advantage of. It came through Klaus Harms. It was not the work of his worldly contemporaries such as Lachman, Kierkegaard, Schelling, Jesenius, Gibbon, Kant, Schiller, Paley, Payne, Fisch, Mill, Napoleon, Egel, Schleiermacher, Talleyrand, Metternich, Pestalozzi, and Beethoven. The world has its heroes, Amen. and etc. Several other people. Thomas Guthrie. And then uh, he mentions other names such as Irving, Perry, Hill, Daniel Rollins, all during the 1800s time. Preach salvation by faith in the finished work of Christ. Amen. They won souls to him in Amen. England, in Scotland, Amen. and America. Yes. Rollins, Rollins had gunpowder placed under his pulpit one time with a chain fuse attached. So let's put Roland Hill. So they placed a gunpowder under his pulpit with a chain fuse attached. And on another occasion, he was fired at with a shotgun at close range. So these men were not sissies. These men held the fort 
they stood for Bible believing truth. They didn't care. Every man listed, preached, and believed in one book. It certainly not was a new ASV. Christmas Evans was a Welsh preacher who proceeded in his revival work by, remember Christmas Evans, but people who preceded him were John Jones, William Williams, Daniel Rowlands, John Elias. In 1742, two great preachers were evangelizing Scotland, William McCulloch and James Glending. McCulloch, near Glasgow, had 400 men and women profess Christ as Savior in one year. Here's another one. Uh, Edward Payson preached as a pastor in Portland, Maine. Samuel Buell on Long Island. Richard Baxter at Kidderminster, along with Bushnell. This is 1802 to 1876. Beecher, 1800 to 1887. Philip Brooks, 1835 to 1892. Frederick Robertson, 1816 to 1853. And John Newman, 1801 to 1890. New men later defected to the Roman Catholic Church. And I'll explain that historical timeline, okay, which is important. Bushnell was led off into the bushes of socialism by the German apostate Schleiermacher and wound up, wound up teaching that no child should ever be told that he was lost or ever needed to be saved. You're, you were to raise him to think that he had been a Christian since birth. Lyman Beecher, though a Trinitarian, was tried for heresy. And although he remained sound in his doctrines on the Trinity, he did teach Origins and Augustine's ancient heresy of postmillennialism and talked constantly about a regenerated humanity so that the kingdom should come. So uh, we see right here that in spite of uh, Great Awakening revival preachers, there was also some heresy that was infiltrating that time. There was some heresy infiltrating that time. And don't forget those cults that came out. All right. Here are some other people that are listed, some heroes. Henry Martin, uh, not Henry Martin. Let's start off with William Grenfell. Wilfred Grenfell worked as a medical missionary in Labrador and Newfoundland. So now we see more missionaries spreading out. They're not done yet. They're continuing on the work. Henry Martin went into Persia. David Livingstone went into East Africa. Han, uh, Alexander Duff went into India. Alfred Saker went into the Cameroons. Alan Francis Gardner uh, sealed his Christian testimony with his blood by starving to death on Picton Island, 1851, off the shores of Patagonia in the Tierra del Fuego. Uh, let's see right here. John Getty. There's another big name. So David Livingstone, I mentioned him briefly, but uh, you can look at his life. But when he died, he died praying on his knees, actually, in the mission field. And then his body was taken back to his homeland in England, but his African converts uh, took out his heart and buried his heart in Africa. That's why there's a famous saying, bury my heart in the mission field. That was taken from David Livingstone himself. John Getty was a Canadian missionary to the New Hebrides. He paved the way for John Patton. All right, this guy is something else, John Patton. He was battling cannibals, actually. He was being a missionary to cannibals. Anyone have the guts to do that for the Lord? Now everyone's scared of street preaching now or witnessing to a soul. John Patton, 1824 to 1907, whose biography reads like a Tarzan thriller. When Getty landed on the island of Aneatim, there were no Christians there. And when he left in 1872, there were no heathen. John Patton took on the headhunters and cannibals of Tana. He took them on with the King James Bible and a hymn book. His wife died. His son died. The mission station was burned to the ground and he lost everything but his Bible and was driven off of Tana. Instead of quitting, he went to work on the island of Aniwa and lived to see every adult native on the island a professing Christian. Amen. Patton had his life directly threatened on at least 30 occasions 
And on at least 20 of the occasions, a weapon was within a foot of his face or body, or a weapon was already coming through the air at him. Every Christian who can read should read the biography of John Patton. Amen. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the biggest devils during that timeline that the devil used was uh, Charles Darwin. But Charles Darwin, when he came to that same island where Patton was, he was amazed on how he was assuming that, you know, through the process of evolution, these people were brutish or uncivilized, far off the evolving process. But then he was shocked to see how they were uh, cultured and singing a hymn book while reading the Bible. So Darwin was so convicted that he, Darwin was so convicted that he even sent a generous donation to the mission board that sent John Patton. So that's the Lord. See, you can see the Great Awakening revival spreading like wildfire and how God was moving. All right. We're going to look at another one right here is George Mueller. That's a name you should never forget. He is a prayer warrior. He is a phenomenal prayer warrior. All right. They told the Prussian George Mueller, and now I'm on page 101. They told the Prussian George Mueller, it couldn't be done. You couldn't raise seven million dollars without sort of the Lord conferences. Uh, lapel pins, gift orders, prayer clubs, initial bricks, settling estates, and toll-free phone numbers. But he did it. All right, George Mueller is very different from today's modern preachers, you notice, right? George Mueller, 1805 to 1898, a Prussian by birth, came to Bristol, England after studying at the Pietist School in Howe. Now remember, those pietists were the ones who were fired up in missions, all right? These guys literally laid the groundwork, the Moravians and the pietists. They were the ones who gave the hope to Europe, you might recall. Uh, continuing on, he proceeded without a salary to raise and care for 10,000 orphans. He then visited 42 countries, wow, through a period of 17 years and traveled over 200,000 miles after he was 70 years old. George read the Bible through on his knees 100 times before he died. Without the benefit of clear translations, better readings, and updating the archaic English. And he contributed over $1 million to foreign missions in a day when an American dollar was worth about 10 times what it is now. Mueller, a transplanted German, only believed, preached, re read, taught, and prayed over one book. It wasn't the RV, although the RV was in print during 14 years of Mueller's life and was being recommended by every apostate fundamentalist and every apostate conservative in England. Dr. Upman, don't hesitate. He calls it out right here. All right, another thing concerning about uh, the Baptists. Don't forget those Baptists, right? Those Baptist preachers were planting churches left and right during the uh, Second Great Awakening. But those Baptists were thinking, no, this is not good enough. So America's not good enough. Let's, not, uh, let's, uh, let's stop planting churches in America. We need to spread out. Yes. Let's go out around the world. Amen. So then the Baptists start to spread out around the world and become missionaries. So here are the Baptists. Page 103, Baptist preachers decided that Kentucky and Tennessee were not far enough from home base. Reverend J.L. Shuck and L.J. Roberts went to Canton, China. Clopion, Percy, Johnson, and Wilden went to Shanghai. And John Day and A.L. Jones established local churches in Liberia and Sierra Leone in Africa. Quillen, Bagby, and Bowen set up mission stations in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I, I don't know how you pronounce uh, that uh, uh, Brazil's name? Rio de, de Janeiro, is that right? All right, just want to make sure. Rio de Janeiro, Santa Barbara, Bahia, and, and Macio in Brazil. Westrup and Powell went out with 12 missionaries to Mexico and preached to Catholics in Saltillo, Patos, Paras, and other places. Dr. W. N. Cote even set up a local independent Baptist church in Rome. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> the heart of the enemy, man. Yeah. And from this work, missionary stations were established in Milan, 
Venice, Bologna, uh, Modena, Capri, Bari, Barletta, and on the island of Sardinia. Man, Rome's got to hate these Baptists. Local Baptist churches popped up in Ta Tasmania, Reverend H. Dowling, New Zealand, Reverend J. Thornton, and Queensland, Stewart and Wilson. Not even Roman Catholic Spain escaped the assault of the old King James 1611 A.V. W.J. Knapp opened a local church with 33 members in Madrid. That's where the Spanish Inquisition was. That's the worst Inquisition, remember. Churches followed in Alicante, La Scala, and Valencia. I'm assuming that's all within Spanish territory. Wow. Baptists were bold. John Mason Peck, uh, let's see, is this right? Yeah. John Mason Peck organized a church in St. Louis, 1818, and tr then traversed in Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana, setting up Sunday schools and Bible societies. All of them were anti-Catholic. A society formed by Peck and Jonathan Going, the American Baptist Home Mission Society, sent 50 missionaries into Canada, Ohio, Mexico, Michigan, uh, Central America, and the Caribbean. One cannot properly evaluate the work of these Bible-believing missionaries if he does not remember that the local churches they set up were independent Bible-believing Baptist churches. You got to realize these are the independent Baptists that we come from in the early days of America. It's the, the third Great Awakening revival was huge, and the second. The great branches of the Northern and Southern Baptist conventions in America in the 20th century, you know where they all come from? The big Southern Baptist churches, the Northern Baptist conventions, had their tap roots in the work of these independent ba Bible-believing Baptists. Who would have thunk, man? What happened to the Southern Baptist Convention in America? Northern Baptist Convention in Australia and other places. See, it's all uh, apostate. It's all apostate. Their beginnings were independent. Yes. Independent Baptists. Uh, they mention right here, they would no more brag about members like Harry Truman, Baptist, Jimmy Carter, Baptist, Martin Luther King Jr. Baptist, then they would brag about Judas, Nero, Bob Ingersoll, or Karl Marx. All right. Yeah, amen to that. All right. Amen to that. Baptists have fallen apart. Now, the, the Baptists are not done. All right. You know where they reached out? Don't forget the, uh, the apostasy going on in Germany. And don't forget also Russia, where the Greek Orthodox Church is uh, well over uh, running the empire. German Baptists in 1800 to 1890 migrated eastward into the Russian Empire and told every Lutheran and Greek Orthodox member they met, as well as Roman Catholic, that baby sprinkling saved no one and that sacraments were no more sacred than sackcloth. Man, the Lord's spreading a revival, amen? Amen. Friedrich Wilhelm Baedeker, 1823 to 1906, was one of the Russian circuit riders who held evangelistic services all over Russia. Guys, these are Baptists I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, the other people, all right, other denominations. I'm talking about Baptists now, all right? This is huge. Uh, we have a proud heritage, our Baptists, where we come from. He encouraged the fiercely persecuted Stundis who are German and Russian Baptists in Russia, and toured the convict camps in Siberia, preaching to the prisoners. At this time, 1890 to 1900, there were less than 10 convict camps, and there were no concentration camps under any Cesar. There are more than uh, 100 at this present writing, and they contain a conservative estimate of 1 million prisoners. You guessed it, the Communist Party liberated Russia, right? So during the time of the czars, uh, Dr. Upman mentions that even during their time, they didn't have that many concentration camps until the communists came. I thought the communists during that time were all about equality and freedom. What happened, right? Just like today, 
equality, freedom, but you'd be soon surprised it turns into government oppression and government control. All right, so Dr. Upman says right here, with this great wave of aggressive, with this great wave of aggressive biblical evangelism, that's what we lack, okay? What we lack is aggressive biblical evangelism, okay? It's all this passive stuff, passive, passive stuff. That's why no one's getting the job done. And church planting came the inevitable education. But since the founding of colleges and seminaries is outside the scope of this present history, we shall not go into details. There were 180 denominational Christian schools in existence in the USA by 1860. There are now more than twice that number. Following the established law of historical cycles, education must follow evangelism. Remember that. E education must follow evangelism. So that's the sign of apostasy. That's what you see within our world. So notice right here that the Great Awakening revivals the, during the second and third was paving away, paving away. We got four more. We got four more Great Awakening revivals. So then the devil had to counterattack again. So the cults weren't working, all right? The revivals were still spreading out. So then the devil raised up two men, and these two men did the job that corrupted all of history even to today. They did a mighty victory. So the devil raised up two champions. I'm going to read A Bible Believer Looks at World History by Frederick Widowson. You can probably guess the first one during this timeline. Karl Marx. It was him and his buddy buddy who are probably sharing the same apartment room in hell. Page 317. In the society, in the society of Europe, the increase in technological advances, industry, and the consolidation of power around the world in the hands of a few major powers all helped to create a rehashing of old philosophies and unrest among the exploited mass of people who worked in unsafe conditions and lived in squalor. The rise of the popular press and newspapers made communicating the unrest easier. Now remember that. All right? That's why news media became a powerful thing for communism ideology later. Okay? Governments that had been used to absolute authority over their subjects like France experienced growing unrest, which culminated in the revolution of 1848. Philosophers like Hegel created an intellectual climate whereby revolutionary philosophers such as Karl Marx came into prominence. Dissatisfaction with the state church of England, the Anglican church, and its stranglehold over advancement in the society helped create a demand for Charles Darwin's theories and their propagation by his own version of Paul, Thomas Huxley. So remember uh, how all the conditions of this civilization is what caused the unrest of the people where they were openly embracing communism as well as evolution. Notice that's the fruits of the Anglican church. That's the fruits of the Anglican church. Well, what were the Baptists doing? That's where America was founded in democracy to begin with, okay? The Constitution, all that, freedom of speech. It was because of the independent Baptists. But no, they don't want to yield to that in France. No, God forbid they'll ever put Jesus in the equation. No, equality, liberty, fraternity, our way, and you saw their fruits. It was such a wonderful kingdom of the reign of terror, they called it, right? Where Napoleon Bonaparte was able to come out after that. That's the fruits without Jesus Christ when you want independence and freedom. But independence and freedom must follow along with Jesus Christ. That was why there was uh, this rebellion against the state church. It's always that state church that messes everything up. I keep telling you. That's the fruits of Calvinism and Catholicism and the Anglican church. That the Puritans came out. And then the independent Baptists were always those rebel rousers. But when they talked about independence, freedom of conscience, it was always within the context of the Bible. Yes. It was a biblical Amen. context. It wasn't a humanitarian, humanism context. When you go by humanism context, you get chaos. Right. Chaos. Right. 
Well, what about the church taking control of society? You saw the fruits of that. It's darkness. Because both societies go without the Bible. See? They go without the Bible. Now, you wouldn't guess where Karl Marx's family lineage is, right? Do some of you know? Born into a German Jewish family that converted to Christianity. Now, what you're going to find out about these men, and this is one thing I notice in history too, so pay attention, church. You know who turned out to be the biggest devils? The ones whom the Lord gives the most truth to. When God reveals the most truth, the devil wants that person. And then the devil will bless that person because that person was about to be a dangerous uh, prospect against the devil's own movement. So the devil wants those people. That's why he always have his evil elites in the Jewish people. That's why Christianity that spread out prosperously became one of the most devilish religions in history. And it's not biblical Christianity, it's Catholicism and apostasy. Devil always aims for God's people, for God's movement. Remember that. If you want the devil's blessings, you know how you get it? You come from a lineage of God's people, God's movement and you can get the devil's blessing. I don't believe in that. One of the biggest devils you ever read was Judas Iscariot. And he was the original 12 disciples of Jesus. He wasn't one of those who flaked out on Jesus. No, he followed him all the way. All right, let that be a lesson, huh? Amen. Amen. Christian and Jewish background. Who would have thunk? But it's not a surprise if you read that book. Yeah. If you see the devil's tactics of what he always does. You'll be surprised that his body is pretty similar too. It's always the Christian background. Think about it. How did Roman Catholicism was born again, remember? From that Christian background. But then the devil mingled it with paganism. All right, continuing on. Karl Marx issued his prophetic, The Communist Manifesto, in 1848. One of the three men who helped create the modern anti-biblical view of the world, he called for the abolition of marriage and private property, free public education, and a central bank. As much maligned as Karl Marx had been, and as much of a failure nations that claim to follow his philosophy are, the United States of America, the most powerful nation on earth at this time, has adopted or is moving toward virtually all of his demands. The Communist Manifesto is free in numerous places online to read and is a real eye-opener to what has been happening in the world over the last 150 years. Believe it or not, it's going the way that the devil wants it in Marx's book. They're all following the devil's uh, handbook and program. One of the most important scientific personages of this time was a man named Charles Darwin, grandson of Erasmus Darwin, Unitarian church cult group, and proponent of, ev of evolution who foreshadowed the work of Lamarck. Charles Darwin served as a naturalist aboard the HMS Beagle from 1831 to 1836 in a British scientific expedition that traveled around the world. His encounter with life on the Galapagos Islands on, off the coast of South America in the Pacific Ocean served as a basis for his own theory of evolution and his profound and harmful influence on a world ready to accept any theory, no matter how unprovable, unscientific or preposterous to justify its rejection of the Bible. People bound for hell will grab at any rationale to justify the journey. Yeah, amen to that. By the way, you wouldn't guess it. He didn't have a degree in science. You know that? Darwin didn't have a degree in science. He had all the scientists go to him. You wouldn't guess what his degree was. You know what his degree was? Theology. Theology. See, the devil's blessing goes on God's children who are willing to follow his program. So you got to watch out. You got to keep your toes. You got to keep on your toes, Christians, because the devil just might use you. The 
devil just might use you. It can be one of the most demonic people that ever lived. So that's why you got to be very careful and get on your toes because the devil, he always aims for uh, God's movement, God's people. He always wants to do that. All right, let me read uh, some things here about uh, Karl Marx and Charles Darwin. Now, Dr. Altman did a very good job. He has a chapter called Backgrounds of the Great Apostasy. He combines all the three together to show how during the 1800s it created this foundation of what we are today, okay? So obviously, Karl Marx, Marx and Darwin are the big key members, okay? And don't forget the third one, which is uh, the Roman Catholic Church, all right? Don't forget the whore of Revelation 17 and 18, those Jesuits where they were storming with biblical criticism. So it was on this voyage that Darwin thought that evolution can uh, come out. <laughs> when he looked at a bunch of birds, all right? Imagine that. That changed everything, all right? That changed everything. Page 196 of Dr. Rutman's book. Karl Marx knew who his buddies in England were. This explains why he wanted to dedicate, uh, why he wanted to dedicate Das Kapital to guess who? Charles Darwin. Didn't you know that? Wow. They, were, they were in connection with each other. If Charlie couldn't read the handwriting on the wall, Carl baby could. <laughs> Marx knew that if the English speaking people ever accepted Darwin's fantastical biological hallucinations as scientific, they would go right on into Disneyland right. and accept Marx's economic theories as scientific. What do you think the communist parties are teaching right now? China and um, North Korea. You know, you know what they're teaching? They're certainly not teaching Christianity in schools. Evolution. See, Marx knew my communism ideology would spread if you do evolution well. That's the birth to everything. These two are the biggest devils that ruined all of society. The graded income tax, compulsory education, abolition of inheritances and private property, gun confiscation, classless societies, the welfare state, welfare state, and the uh, all of it is in one package. You cannot separate animal origins from animal conduct, and animal conduct must be controlled by a zoo. The only question is a question of final authority. Which animal will run the zoo? All right, do you all understand what I'm talking about? So what he's talking about, I know Dr. Upman talks about this weird, you know, uh, casual talk, but he's giving you a lot of insight right here. What he's saying right here is that if you believe you're animals, then in our minds, because we're all animals, they must be controlled. That's the idea. That's the bottom line what he's talking about. Because animal instinct, animal behavior, all must be controlled. But then, like he said, the problem is final authority. Who runs the zoo? Yeah. Who's the animal that runs the zoo? See, that's the problem with this stupid, uh, this stupid ideology, okay? They think that everybody's an animal, so they need to be controlled. But they themselves don't think, these special elites don't think, I'm the animal. That needs to be controlled, too. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, man. Yeah. Amen. University grads believe in this kind of garbage? I could, say, I could say a lot more words, but I don't want to, all right? Probably lose my testimony. All right, here we go. Marx, Darwin, uh, page 197. Marx, Darwin, and company set up the dual authorities of the Alexandrian cult and take on the Bible with the intent of blotting it out of existence. In the Bible, the ownership of private property is honored. Matthew 20, verse 15, Acts 5, 4. The rights of the employer are sustained. Matthew 20, verse 15. Mark's lifestyle is condemned. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10. His religious beliefs are nullified. Psalm 19, 1 through 2, 119, 89, chapter 160. Darwin's scholarship is classified as a dunce's cap. Romans 1, 22. And his theory on origins is rammed down his throat by Jesus Christ himself. 
Mark 10, 6, Matthew 24, 37, John 5, 46 through 47. Amen. You go home and look at those verses. One can only come to the conclusion that Marxism and Darwinism were two parlor games for spoiled brats who resented biblical preaching. Come on. Exactly right. Because a great awakening revivals were spreading and there were people who did not want to be convicted of their sin, who want to live the way they lived. These two men, these two devils right here gave that to the world who want to reject God and the preaching and the Bible. Didn't you know that, that neither man was a worker? Yes. Neither man was a peasant? Neither man was one of the downtrodden masses? Neither man was even a farmer? And neither man had the sense that God gave to a brass monkey when it came to objective analysis of mankind's problems? Then why would the world follow these two men? They don't have doctorates. You know why? The, and why do doctorates praise these men? Who's the crazy, insane psycho? The world is so stupid nowadays. Yep. Now it was this deadly combination. Nothing is more deadly than a zealous fanatic who doesn't have the sense that God gave a brass monkey that drifted across England and her colonies in the 19th century. Of course, there were variations. Here are the other names. Lyle, Paley, tried to hang on to some vestiges of Darwinism. Hobbes, Lord Herbert, John Locke, Thomas Brown, Tolan, Cooper, Whitson, Wollaston, Woolston, Bolingbroke, etc. And Darwin tried desperately at least to maintain a first cause. Hugsley was the one who talked him out of it, the first cause argument. And when the Fabian society got into full swing, the deity, for all practical purposes, became social perfection. Social perfection. All right. Now, this is the timeline of the society that you want to know on how everything came about. Okay. Um, we got some time right here. Catholicism was on the rise where they're trying to do the ecumenical movement with the Christian churches. Try to get the Christians back into Mother Rome. And then the textual criticism, criticizing the Bible. These two monstros monstrosities are the reason why Revival has weakened. Great Awakening Revival has weakened. It's compromise and critiquing that book. Now look at our churches. Isn't that what you see? Compromise, getting along with each other and critiquing that book. No, it doesn't literally mean that way. Doctrines divide, they say, right? It's all about the love of Jesus. Any fool can say that then. Any cult can say that then. Now how are we supposed to tell what's right and wrong? Great Awakening Revival was spread because of one book that they knew was right. And they believed it to be true and they preached out of it. That's, that's the simple thing. But these complex things have destroyed all of that one by one. You critique the Bible. You uh, don't make a big deal about doctrines. And you all have an ecumenical movement. And then you can get Marxism and evolution spreading out where people can endorse that. Now, here we go. All right. The Dr. Upman says on page 184, pay attention, this is very important. You have to understand that this, why this is the same time period that brought about the greatest apostasy. As a matter of fact, Dr. Upman said this, even though the age of Philadelphia was the age of the greatest revival that you would ever see for New Testament church history, it was also the greatest foundation of apostasy the greatest foundation of apostasy as well, that the enemies took over. Behind the scenes, the devils were at the works. Now, here are the conditions that lay out. You can see these foundations are what contribute to today's society, so pay attention. If you're going to forget everything that I say, pay attention to this part. What brought about this low-pressure area? Okay, why? Why did everything fall apart? Three major factors appear all at once. The devil had it all at one pot. And this culmination was what did it. 
the substitution of the newspaper and magazines for the Bible in the daily reading habits of the populaces of Europe, England, and the USA. Wow. Now it's... That's why socialism, communism spread out. That's why liberal universities, governments, liberal ideologies want to take over media spreading out in technology. To brainwash and spread socialistic ideologies. The Pope's reasons for objecting to this freedom of the press was that they saw in it a threat to their own political organization. An informed public would not remain Catholic very long. Catholicism's strong suit has always been the ignorance of their church members in regards to the imperialistic and political designs of the hierarchy and how these designs are carried out. So there was control of the press that time, right? Freedom of the press would be a horrible thing. What could be more horrible than 100 dailies Think about this. Dr. Altman's right. What could be more horrible than 100 daily newspapers, so to speak, dailies printing canon law or the decrees of the Council of Trent or the history of the St. Bartholomew Massacre? This is why the popes violently opposed freedom of the press. However, the news media was not going to be any kind of a threat to Roman Catholicism for the Marxist news Media was a worldly institution set up on the same principles as Rome. Financial and political expediency. Okay, so what was back then, no freedom of the press. Now you get freedom of the press, but it's been used toward a different demonic advantage. Remember, Catholicism's job is to morph like a chameleon so it can survive and thrive in the times. They can't control all the information spreading out. It's spreading out. Ever since the King James Bible was spreading it all out. Now the press was spreading it all out. Freedom of speech from the Constitution, right? But that was born from a Baptist distinctive, remember? So this is dangerous. So then, why not turn the newspaper, Freedom of the Press, into ideologies that would benefit socialism or Catholicism? The Bible continued to be the real danger to Catholicism. And as long as the Bible was not printed weekly in all the newspapers, Rome could adjust. See, they change. There isn't one major newspaper or TV station or radio station in North America that is anti-Catholic. They are all pro-Catholic. However, there are hundreds of these outlets that are against the Bible, Against freedom of speech, yes. Against the local church, against law enforcement, against capital punishment, against ownership of guns, against nationalism, against patriotism, and against moral standards. In short, what does that mean? They're communist. That's what it means. They are communist oriented. They are designed to produce a slave population which a Catholic dictator could take over. Since modern man, you don't believe in that? You ever, you ever looked into Fidel Castro's history? People don't read. They don't study. Since modern man now gets his ideas about life, science, death, religion, morals, politics, international affairs, and education, largely from the Marxist news media, TV, newspapers, and magazines, it is not surprising to find that Stalin, Lenin, Engels, and Marx, listen, were all members of the fourth estate, not the proletariat. They were journalists, not workers or farmers. Can I repeat that again? They were journalists, not workers or farmers. And why do you believe the stinking news media? Ask, ask CNN, what's your degree at? In journalism. And they're the ones fact-checking? Can you believe that? I don't know what's, uh, who's more insane, the reader or the news journalist. I don't know who's more stupid, man. All right. I say that with charity, of course. All right. When the background of the Russian Revolution is studied as the background of the French Revolution, it is quick, quickly seen that the real men behind it are not workers. 
Workers of the World Unite has nothing to do with Marx or Lenin, who never did an honest day's work a day in their lives. And the evidence is Marx's children starved themselves to death. What is that, man? He's a failure even as a normal human being. If there was anything outstanding about Trotsky and Karl Marx, it was the fact that neither of them were born as peasants or workers. Neither did any factory or farm work, and neither of them had enough calluses on his hands to shave a baby's cheek. Robertson calls such men Grokites, although the original word was political opportunist. That's who they are, political opportunists. Lenin was a truckler, a journalist who goes along with international socialism so as to guarantee his own security and preeminence. Lenin did not create a communist Russia. He created a machine for military imperialism and it was designed so that he might be its dictator. He died too quickly and Stalin got the honored place. Russia today has nothing to do with the proletariat or downtrodden working classes. It is an imperialistic military society controlled by the middle class bourgeois police NK, uh, during that time, NKVD. But anyway, Lenin, Trotsky, and Marx were students before they became journalists. Did you hear that? Lenin, Trotsky, and Marx were students before they became journalists. It's always that higher ed blankety blank that brainwashes a generation. Then they get the power of the media and have them dictate to you what is right and wrong. And this explains why all 20th century communist movements begin with students. This is good. This explains why all 20th century communist movements begin with students or professors in colleges and then get publicity from the press. Is this guy a prophet or what, this Ruckman? Screaming out loud right now, ever since 2020 and onward, we're seeing that plain as day. All right, uh, this is a long reading, so I don't have time. Okay. Bible reading, uh, I'm skipping to page 186. Lots of good reading here, but I'm going to skip that. Page 186. Bible reading in the home was replaced with the reading of newspapers and magazines. These were supplemented with radio and TV. Thus, the populaces of America were raised on Marxist fantasy instead of reality. Lies instead, lies instead of the truth. Non-moral paganism instead of biblical morality. Pornographic excesses, in, uh, pornographic excesses instead of decent literature. There we go. Pseudo-scholarship, pseudo-religion, pseudo-science, and above all, an addiction to anything new that could be called news. The coming one world communistic Catholic Church had to condition its members before opening its doors. That's what's going on right now, right? All right, number two, the problem. The baleful influence of Christian colleges, universities, and seminaries. Hall, Tübingen, Chicago, Harvard, Yale, Col Colgate, Oxford, Cambridge. Once the evangelists and Bible believers had left them and passed on westward. Since the final goal of all higher education, Christian or atheistic, is to destroy belief in one final and absolute authority, it was only a matter of time before the authority of the Bible was replaced, listen, with the opinions and philosophies of the faculty members who may have been or may not have been saved sinners. No major church historian has been able to write a church history yet that doesn't trace the sources of rationalism, liberalism, socialism, and modernism to educated Christians whose roots and backgrounds are connected with orthodox seminaries and university students and professors. That is a huge eye-opener right there. Huge eye-opener. You don't want to follow that movement. Real New Testament local churches are never found involved 
one time in any social or political issues of their day and time other than in preaching against specific sins and praying that God would overthrow the designs of those opposed to the truth. No New Testament church was a member of any association or council. And there isn't one New Testament church in the Bible that concerned itself over the liberation, let alone the just economic distribution of welfare sharing with the underprivileged minorities. All right, third is old mother Rome. She never cashed in her chips or racked out of the pool hall simply because she lost England, Scotland, and the United States. Using the unsaved philosophers from whom she had condemned as levers to destroy the faith of Protestant Christians in their Bible, Rome went about her work inside the Christian schools to run faculty members back to a Dark Age Bible and the sacramental ritualism of Catholic Christianity. Okay, so uh, I am going to go, I am going to read this quickly. I have to finish this. That way you don't lose your thought. Okay, you might say, what, is that really happening? Yeah, so this is Widowson's book, page 322. So don't forget the Anglican church in England, right? So remember the Jesuit teaching is spreading from French schools and French enlightenment to German schools German rationalism, that included the Christian seminaries. Man, God help them, man. They went apostate. Now it was England's turn, where the KJB translators came from Oxford and Cambridge. They were about to be infected with that Jesuit nonsense. So remember, the state church is Anglican church, right? So the Anglican church, remember I mentioned that it's not really much different from Catholicism. The only difference is that King Henry VIII split it off. It has its histories of reformers, due to Luther's Reformation. So Anglican is like a half-half, so to speak, all right? Even though I see it as more Catholic. But what, where it was half-half and anything of Reformed teaching or anything of the Bible in it, it fell away. It fell away into the apostasy of the Catholic Church. And this is known as uh, the Oxford Movement. And they were based off of the Tractarian movement. That's an important movement you want to know. This movement was responsible where they finally got the Protestant church to hold hands with the Catholic church. They got the Anglican to fall. So they were infiltrating. Why? It's all scholars, remember. It's all educations. That's how they infiltrate. All right, so this is it from page 322. Leaving science in the first half of the 19th century, let's now go to some of the world-changing events that started in the Anglican Church or the Church of England. Richard Froud, John Keeble, and Edward Pussy were all leaders of what became known as the Tractarian Movement within the Anglican Church, also called Pussyites. They, as scholars in the Anglican Church, see scholars, always scholars, the State Church of England, which was now the dominant world power, conquering more territory than any empire in history, believed and expressed in the tracts they published that the Roman Catholic Church was correct in that Christ's body was really present in communion, which they viewed the same as the Catholic Mass. They urged a closer accord with Rome, one of their disciples, John Henry Newman, like Dr. Uckman mentioned, right? He was that big guy who was part of that Third Great Awakening revival. But he fell away. Also published various tracts. While he claimed that the Anglican Church was more worthy of being called the Inheritor of apostolic authority than the Church of Rome, he was accused by some of being an agent of Rome and trying to steer the Anglican Church back into a union with Rome. This was the big guy that made everything fall. The Oxford movement, based at the university there of what are called High Anglicans, believed in the need for a full communion between Rome and the English Church. Wow, we need to communicate with each other. This movement was resisted by many of the Orthodox, but slowly began making itself important. It supposedly ended when Newman converted to the Roman Catholic religion in 1845. His true colors were revealed. 
Anglo-Catholicism is a very powerful force even today worldwide. And it is believed by many that one day the two churches will mend the breach caused by Henry VIII and reunite. This movement had a very great detrimental effect on other Protestant churches and even American evangelical and fundamentalist churches in the early 20th century. Another important in the early 19th century, Anglicanism was the son of a Unitarian minister. Don't forget those Unitarian guys. Named Frederick Maurice or F.D. Maurice. What about this guy? Who championed the cause of what was called Christian socialism. In, respo in response to the harsh working class conditions of England, his many heresies would shape many of the personalities which began, to shape the, which began to alter the shape of Christian thinking. There's no doubt these three were the ones that gave the birth to change all of civilization and the world today. You have to remember that. And it's all done through the news media press and scholars, through these three of Marxism, evolution, and Catholicism. German rationalism did reach English deism. It, it reached England, the scholars. Why? Because some of those dumb scholars went to Germany. And then they picked up some of their teachings and carried it on with them. So let me uh, read this quickly, okay? Because I don't have much time and you guys want to go home, obviously. All right, so last paragraph. A drug-addicted poet and philosopher, one of the founders of the Romantic movement in the English poetry, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, brought these ideas to England. So biblical criticism, all right? No greater damage has been done to Christianity by forces outside of it than by these men working from within. Scholars and Anglican churchmen like Benjamin Jowett would travel to Germany to study the criticism of the Bible, Falling under the spell of men like F.C. Bauer, leader of the Tübingen School of Theology, theology, school of theology, remember, Tübingen would become important later as the home university of, you want to you guess, Gerhard Kittel. That was the home university of Kittel. You might say, why? Because he was a man who was tried as a war, war criminal with Hitler. Because he was Hitler's main Christian apologist. The fruits, man, the fruits of school, you know, Christian universities. He and his father, Kittle and his father, Rudolph, are also highly respected Bible scholars whose works grace many a fundamentalist pastor's bookshelves, even today. You want to believe it? Go ahead, look it up, all right? These Anglican scholars in the early part of the 19th century would, become, would come to believe things like Semler's accommodation theory, whereby it is said that you can't really believe Genesis literally. Wow. See, biblical criticism is rising to more liberal ideologies right here. As God was trying to make things as simple as possible for these ignorant tent-dwelling Semites, and that Jesus and Paul were also accommodating the level of sophistication or lack thereof of their listeners. It, see, all that uh, education pride, right? Yeah. It is clear that the foxes were now in the hen house and that wolves in sheep's clothing had infested the scholarly church in Christendom. With arguments put forth by men like Johann Jakob Greisbach and Karl Lachmann, who presumed the New Testament to be hopelessly corrupted against the Bible, it would take less than a hundred years for this level of unbelief and blasphemy to filter to the American evangelical denominations. The idea that the Bible, a supernatural book with prophecies that have double and triple applications, with verses split in half by thousands of years of history, and with the ability to change a believer's heart and life, was just another old book full of faults, mistakes, and mythology served to undermine its proper place in the Christian's heart and life. Up until this time, if there was something the average Christian didn't understand, he was told to read it again and again, prayerfully asking God for light. Now many Christians want the words of God to submit to them rather than them to do it. Let me read that again. Now many Christians want the words of God to submit to them rather than, rather than them to it. You need to study the Bible for yourselves. 
The entire basis for the reformation, the authority of the word of God over the word of man is in grave danger, if not defeated in the hearts and minds of the majority of Protestant denominations. The Jesuits won with their textual criticism. It reached to the liberal scholars who wanted it. It spread throughout the universities and it reached the heart of the reformers in England. Pretty soon America is going to be infected. Pretty soon America is going to be infected during that time. So it's incredible about the apostasy that spread amazingly and a lot of people were falling down. So it's uh, really sad. Now, it's at this perfect time, this was such a perfect time, when biblical criticism is rising and God said, we need Bible study to amp up. And with Bible study amping up, where people find contradictions in the Bible, faults, you need to rightly divide. Here we go. John Nelson Darby is about to teach, and he is titled the Father of Dispensationalism. The Lord, there is no doubt God and the Holy Spirit were behind the scenes with the devil also. There is absolutely no doubt. None of these events are a coincidence. Father God, I pray that today's teaching have uh, burdened the hearts of the hearers, realizing that the event we're living in is not a coincidence. It's a battle of heaven and hell. Help us to be aware of the fight, be aware of our purpose, of our contribution, what we could do for you, and not be sucked in by the program of the world. In Jesus' name we pray.